Now that we've introduced the idea of a bargaining game, the next step is to introduce what's called a solution concept. So what is a solution concept? Well, it's a function will denote a general solution concept as phi, and this function associates to each bargaining game an alternative, so an element from that bargaining game, which will be the solution for that game. So essentially it contains two dimensions, a utility phi 1 of s for player 1 and a utility phi 2 of s for player 2. A very simple example of a solution concept could be the function that simply assigns the disagreement point, the uh, vector of two zeros, to every bargaining problem. That would be a well-defined uh, solution concept, always disagree. Of course, it's not a particularly nice solution concept. So what would a nice solution concept look like? Well, we're going to proceed axiomatically. That is, we're going to write down a list of properties that we would like our solution concept to satisfy. Remember, we're not modeling the bargaining process here. Rather, we're trying to write down a list of properties of the outcomes of whatever a rational bargaining procedure might look like. Nash proposed four axioms for bargaining solutions. There are many other axioms available in the literature, but we're going to study Nash's axioms as our starting point today. The four axioms that we will consider are called Pareto efficiency, symmetry, linear invariance, and independence of irrelevant alternatives. So let's go through these four axioms in turn, explain what they mean, and then state them formally as properties of our solution concept. Our first axiom, axiom one, is Pareto efficiency. Any microeconomic student will be well aware of Pareto efficiency by this stage of their training. So let's just recall what it would mean in this situation. So if we consider a bargaining game, such as this uh, bargaining set S here, and we pick an alternative in this bargaining set, uh, alternative A, where player one receives utility A1 and player two uh, receives utility A2. Well, what's wrong with this alternative being chosen as a solution to the bargaining uh, game S? Well, uh, if I look at alternative B, under alternative B, um, player two gets a strictly greater utility and player one gets exactly the same utility. So in a sense, why would player one object to B once he's agreed to alternative A. Similarly, if we look at alternative C, uh, we have the analogous situation where player two receives the same utility as they would under alternative A, but player one receives greater utility under alternative C. In short, alternative A is not Pareto efficient. It is Pareto dominated. There are other alternatives where at least one player does strictly better and no player does worse. In fact, in this case, there are alternatives where both players do strictly better. And one would hope that whatever the bargaining procedure is, one would hope that rational players in this game would not end up choosing an alternative like uh, alternative A. Hopefully, they would choose something that is Pareto efficient. So what is the set of Pareto efficient uh, alternatives in this case? It's sometimes called the Pareto frontier. So I've sketched it into in a green curve here, this uh, kind of northeast boundary of our set S. Towards the axis, this set S kind of ba bends back in on itself. So this frontier uh, doesn't go all the way to the axis. And our axiom for Pareto efficiency is basically going to ask that whatever the solution is to this game, that it is somewhere along this frontier. Otherwise, we would be picking an alternative that is Pareto dominated. So let's see the formal statement of this axiom. Axiom one, Pareto efficiency says, for all bargaining games S, the solution concept selects an alternative phi of S that is Pareto efficient. Formally, that is, there are no other alternatives A in our bargaining game S that are greater than phi of s and not equal to phi of s. Remember, we're, this is a, a vector inequality. So if a is greater than uh, or equal to phi of s, um, that includes the 
uh, case where both coordinates are equal, but if A is not equal to phi of S and is also greater than or equal, then at least one coordinate is strictly larger. Next, let's consider axiom two, the axiom of symmetry. So essentially, this axiom says when the bargaining set is symmetric, then the solution be, should be symmetric as well. So let's represent this graphically. Here I've uh, drawn a bargaining set S that is symmetric. How do I know it's symmetric? Well, one way of thinking about this is that if I relabel these axes, so if I cross out the utility of player two on the vertical and the utility of player one on the horizontal and replace them with the opposite player, then the bargaining set looks exactly the same. So uh, that's what we mean by symmetry intuitively, but we can describe it formally as follows. If I pick an alternative, here I've labeled it a two dimensions alpha and beta, then I know that the game is symmetric if whenever alpha beta belongs to the bargaining set S, then so does beta alpha. So its symmetric partner also belongs to the bargaining set. If that is true for all alpha and beta, uh, that where alpha beta pairs belong to S, then the set S is symmetric. The symmetry axiom simply asks that in situations like this, where the game is symmetric, the solution phi of S should be symmetric too. What does this mean graphically? It means it's somewhere along this 45 degree line. And that's all it means. Notice that for games that are not symmetric, this axiom has no bite at all. So we're not going to impose symmetric solutions on games that are not symmetric, not necessarily, but we're simply saying when the game is symmetric, the solution should be symmetric too. So let's see the formal content of this axiom. Axiom two, symmetry says if a bargaining game is symmetric, then the solution concept should select an alternative phi of S that is also symmetric. That is for all bargaining games S, such that uh, A1, A2 belongs to S only if A2, A1 belongs to S as well. So every alternative in S has a symmetric partner, which is also in S, so the game is symmetric we have that the utility assigned to player one by the solution concept phi, phi one of S, is equal to phi two of S, the utility, the solution concept assigns to player two in the game S. So far, we've been discussing the idea of a solution concept assigning utilities to each of the players in this game. Hopefully at this point, you should be quite sceptical about this idea of assigning utility numbers because we know utility numbers are not unique. That is, I can describe exactly the same decision maker's preferences using many different von Neumann Morgenstern utility functions. And we know precisely the relationship between these. I can take any positive affine transformation of a von Neumann Morgenstern utility function and describe the, the preferences of the very same decision maker. Now, in our model so far, we've asked that the disagreement point is always assigned a utility of zero. So we've reduced the degrees of freedom a little here. We can no longer add whatever we want to utility numbers if the utility of a certain point always has to be zero. But we are able to multiply utilities by any positive constant and be assured that we are still talking about the same person. So our solution concept is going to need to take account of this. This is the point of the linear invariance axiom. So let me show you how this works. So let's suppose that we consider a bargaining game S depicted here in the diagram and suppose that our solution concept phi selects an alternative phi of S uh, in this bargaining set. I've drawn it here on the Pareto frontier. So um, this phi of S is assigning a utility number for each player. Player 1 receives utility phi 1 of S and player 2 receives utility phi 2 of S. Now underlying this utility representation are physical alternatives that are actually being bargained over. So let's suppose, for example, that these utility numbers are reflecting the outcome where the physical alternatives for each player are 
player one gets £120 and player two gets £90. That's uh, what the utility phi one of S and phi two of S would mean in this particular choice of utility function. I've drawn in here some indications of the scales of the utility, so some markers 1, 2 and 3 on each axis. So roughly it looks like the solution concept phi is assigning utility around 2.5 for player 2 and maybe around 5 for player 1. And under this choice of utility function that corresponds to player 1 having, for example, £120 and player 2 having £90. So let's examine the scale of utility a little more. Well, I can multiply player 1's utilities by 10. So instead of the scale reading 1, 2, 3, it now reads 10, 20, 30. So I've effectively compressed the scale on this axis. And let's do the same for player 2. Let's multiply player 2's utility numbers by 100. So now the numbers read 100, 200 and 300. Again, I've compressed the axis so these axes are no longer on the same scale as each other. So what would this particular point now mean? It would be, well, if I take a, a, a vector alpha, which has two dimensions, alpha 1 is 10, that's what we multiplied player 1's utility by, and alpha 2 is 100, that's the factor by which we multiplied player 2's utility numbers, then this point in the diagram is alpha phi of s, alpha times phi of s. So let's draw in a bargaining set that on this new axis, it looks just like our original problem, but of course it's not because the uh, scale the, on these axes has been changed. So what is this problem? Well, let's call it alpha s. And what do we mean by alpha s? Well, essentially an alternative a belongs to s, if and only if uh, the alternative alpha a belongs to alpha s. So we're taking every alternative in the bargaining set s, multiplying it by our vector alpha. So player 1's utilities are multiplied by 10, for example. Player 2's utilities are multiplied by 100. And then drawing a new bargaining game. But we know that even though this bargaining game mathematically is different, Numeric, the numerical representation is different, we are representing the same underlying bargaining problem here. The physical alternatives underlying this bargaining game are exactly the same. So what would we want our solution to do? Well, we want our solution phi of alpha s to equal alpha phi of s. In this way, the, uh, the numerical representation of the game, the Remember, utility is just a tool for our analysis. We don't want it to change the outcome. So we want uh, out phi of alpha s to choose the same physical alternatives. For example, uh, 120 for player one and 90 pound for player two. So the utility representations don't matter too much. Uh, the same physical alternatives are being chosen in both of these different representations of the same game. That's the idea of the linear invariance axiom. So let's see the formal statement of the axiom. Axiom 3, linear invariance says, the physical alternative selected by our solution concept phi should be the same for all equivalent utility representations. That is, if the bargaining game S is transformed to alpha S, where alpha 1 and alpha 2 are both strictly positive, then our solution concept is transformed in the same way. The solution to the transformed problem alpha s is the transformed solution of the original problem alpha times phi of s. Notice at this point that if we hadn't restricted disagreement utility to zero, then we could have an axiom called affine invariance, which would handle positive affine transformations, so transformations of scale and location multiplying and adding, it would capture the same intuition as the linear invariance axiom for us. Finally, let's discuss Nash's fourth axiom, independence of irrelevant alternatives. So let's start by considering a bargaining game, capital T. So this is, we're going to think of capital T as our large bargaining game. Now, our solution concept Let's suppose that it selects an alternative in capital T, 
called Fire of Tea. Now consider a smaller bargaining game, denoted capital S. So the pink set, and notice two things in particular about this set. First of all, the bargaining game S is a subset of the bargaining game T. Second of all, notice that the solution to the larger game, so phi of t, also belongs to the smaller game. Well, the axiom independence of irrelevant alternative requires that the same solution is chosen in the bargaining game, uh, capital S. So phi of s is equal to phi of t. The intuition for independence of irrelevant alternatives would be that, well, when we have the large problem t and we decide that phi of t is the best, we have essentially uh, ruled that all of the other alternatives in t are no longer relevant. So if we only look at a subset of them, for instance, the bargaining game S, we've already decided that phi of t is the, is the alternative that we want, and we should continue to choose it because it's still available. So let's state the formal content of axiom 4, independence of irrelevant alternatives, this says, for all bargaining games S and T, where S is a subset of T, so T is the larger game and it contains the bargaining game S, if the solution to the large game T also belongs to the smaller game S, then the solution to the smaller game phi of S is equal to phi of T. Actually, this kind of property is always satisfied whenever our uh, solution concept is the result of maximizing some function. So to get the intuition, let's go back in time to year one and remember some consumer theory. So if we had a, a consumer trying to maximize a utility function over a budget set, you may remember that this tangency condition was the typical solution characterizing the consumer's demands. Well, let's suppose we delete uh, several things from this budget set, things that the consumer is not choosing already, like this. So I've just chopped off the corners of this budget set. Clearly, the utility maximizing uh, bundle is exactly the same. There is an axiom in consumer theory called the weak axiom of revealed preferences, which essentially captures this very same idea. The axiom in bargaining theory, independence of irrelevant alternatives, which I believe Nash discovered before Samuelson proposed the weak axiom in consumer theory, captures the very same idea. One of the controversial things about the axiom independence of irrelevant alternatives is simply its name. So deeming that some alternatives were irrelevant to the bargaining process does indeed seem like a rather large assumption. And so some top authors working in bargaining theory prefer to use the term contraction independence. So contraction independence really describes the mathematical property as the bargaining set contracts, but the solution remains in the set, then the solution doesn't change. That's the idea of axiom four.